You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So I figure today we should uh, finish up this Bob McGinn thing. We uh, ripped through most of the defense. We did not do defensive tackles, so I want to do that. And then I want to go through the offense. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Bob McGinn um, over at Go Long. Make sure you uh, subscribe if you're interested in reading into these things. He talked to a bunch of scouts at the scouting combine, et cetera, et cetera, prior to, I suppose, um, and just kind of got their initial thoughts. He created a top 55. He doesn't actually rank them here, but um, of the top 55 guys, what do scouts have to say about them? So that's what we're going to do today. Any time remaining, which I don't expect a ton, if any, um, we'll turn it over to calls. Also, rather than reading through it, um, we're just going to go ahead and uh, sort of summarize sort of the highs, the lows, and any potential flags that these guys have. So defensive tackles will start off with, and, and by the way, these are obviously all the guys that made the top 55. So in his mind or on his list, it's Byron Murphy, Darius Robinson, Braden Fisk, Jerzon Newton, and Tavondre Sweat. So starting off with Byron Murphy, obviously the excitement for him is the athleticism and the pass rush ability extremely explosive football player. I know defensive tackle is not our biggest need, but I would be over the moon if we got a guy like Byron Murphy. Some of the concerns that were put out there, um, size, some thoughts that he may need to be put next to a bigger player, and the fact that he may not be able to handle a two-gap system. Now, fortunately for us, we've gotten away from that. So that's not as big of a concern um, for the Packers anymore. Also, some uh, potential flags, the limited arm length, might scare some people, not scare them away, but make them a little bit nervous. But uh, some of the biggest things in the positive are high character and work ethic. Now, I love that high character thing. That was the the third scout said he's a high character guy. Love that because you know the Packers are always looking for high character guys. Darius Robinson, who again is seen by a lot of people as an edge guy. I I, I can't get involved or interested in him as an edge guy, but on the interior, it's a possibility. He's listed here as an interior guy. Um, Some of the highs, impressive transition from DT to edge, which led to a standout season. Uh, He's noted for his technique, his strength, his use of his hands, good vert, and good arm length. Were some concerns about his uh, slow 40 time. Some guys see him more as a rotational guy than a starter due to his lack of uh, distinguishing talent. I guess the only real flags there would be some people not really sure exactly how to use them. Next up is Braden Fisk out of Florida State. Some of the highs, extremely hard worker, plays with great intensity. He was best at his position at the uh, 40-yard dash, the vert, and the broad jump at the combine. He's obviously praised for athleticism and effort. Some of the negatives, concerns about his size, the lack of length, could limit his effectiveness against larger offensive linemen, and has a history of multiple injuries. So obviously the red flag there would be the injuries, but that's sort of a pass-fail thing. I think these guys, they check out their medicals and they decide whether or not they're okay drafting them. If they are, then they put them on the board. If not, they take them off. 
Then they got Jerzon Newton, who's down a little bit lower than uh, I would probably want to put him, but Jerzon Newton out of Illinois, strong and disruptive player, good instincts, great leverage, noted for his ability to play through injuries and produce on a less competitive team. Some of the negatives, uh, less athletic and explosive compared to his peers. Some scouts question his consistency and his motor. As a result, some of the uh, potential red flags for him might be work ethic. When you've got a low motor and inconsistency, people feel like you're kind of giving up, whether that be play-to-play or game-to-game. And then finally, they got Tavondre Sweat out of Texas. Obviously, he's noted for being a massive human being, uh, very strong There are concerns about his weight and conditioning, possibly some uh, Eddie Lacy issues there. Also, similar to Jerzon, there's some questions about his work ethic and consistency. Scouts are saying that he plays in spurts and uh, may always struggle with his weight. So, I'm all the way out on Tavondre Sweat. I am uh, definitely a fan of Jerzon. I'm a huge fan of Byron Murphy, though. Um, But it is exciting to not have to care. Uh, That's a stupid thing to say. It's... (laughs) It's exciting to be able to just get excited about the most exciting things. What I mean by that is, essentially what we're looking for, the the absolute most important thing, it's always been the most important thing, but even more important now, is just a guy that gets upfield and gets after the quarterback. And so all the dirty work stuff that, you know, whereas before you're like, yeah, but it's kind of important. We put a lot of emphasis on that defensive line and the run support, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's just kind of like, hey, man, can you really quickly just get up field and and get after it? Yes? Okay, perfect. You're in. So, again, it's exciting to get excited about the exciting stuff. All right, kicking it over to the offense finally. Let's start with the quarterbacks. Caleb Williams, obviously um, very exciting prospect. Some of the quotes are ultimate playmaker and rare feel for the game. Uh, obviously there's some comparisons there to Pat Mahomes. He does have that sort of style, strong arm and big play ability with comparisons also to Kyler Murray. Some of the negatives though, struggles under pressure as was evidenced by the Notre Dame game. Uh, one of the scouts went so far as to say he has awful mechanics, which I just, I love this so much. Just, you know what we should do as unfair and un, uh, unusual as it would be. We should just start the, um, since we know who the Bears are going to draft, we should just start trashing Caleb Williams. You know, like just just a baptism for Caleb Williams. Welcome to Chicago. Sorry you couldn't be a Packer. I mean, you know, I love Jordan Love and all, but I mean, he's a Packer fan. I'm sure he would have loved to have been here and all that. You know, I mean, we would have loved to have him. It would have been great. But anyways, in, in, in another universe, in another life, whatever. Now that you're a Bear, I have to hate you, right? So Justin Fields... I love Justin Fields. I don't like the narrative around Justin Fields, but Justin Fields, huge fan. Love that guy. Hope he has great success. He's a, I hear he's a big, uh, he's a great friend of our quarterback, Jordan Love. They're good friends. They hang out. Hopefully Jordan can teach him how to play quarterback. He goes on to have great success. Caleb, though, dude's a douche. Just an absolute loser. Anyways, awful mechanics. Um, I'm actually excited about that episode. I'm sorry. Let's continue. Also is described as having a playground uh, playground type of quarterback and risks injuries outside of the pocket. Some of the red flags, there are concerns about his entourage and external interests with his father described as a pain in the you know what and having a quote unquote management team. So that's going to be freaking awesome to dig into when we do the anti Caleb Williams thing. Moving on to Jaden Daniels, who let's be honest, is hopefully the better quarterback of the group or Drake May or any of them. I couldn't give a crap. Um, some of his highs, incredible arm and quote, rare escapability, competitive, productive, and compared to Lamar Jackson. So he's sort of the Lamar, Justin Fields camp. I kind of like the camps thing as opposed to comps. Camps, not comps. Make a t-shirt out of that. Plus everybody gets annoyed with comps. Like, oh yeah, you're going to say he's like him. It's like, well, qualitative, not quantitative. You know what I mean? Same group. Anyways, and then won the Heisman in 2023 showed a vast improvement over his college career. Some of the lows, misses on short to medium passes, raising doubts about his consistency as a passer, concerns about his durability due to his size. That's a pretty common thing we keep hearing every year. Uh, Flags, nothing super serious, just refused to work out or be measured at the combine, which could potentially raise some questions about his transparency or physical attributes. But I mean, he's obviously going to be, I mean, he's... (laughs) 
I don't know. I think that's a stupid note. Drake May out in North Carolina. Some of his highs, strong arm, can move around, and has potential. One scout noted his uh, style is sort of the Tom Brady church, whatever that means. So there's your camp, pocket passer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Some of the negatives, lack of improvement, inability to elevate his team, particularly was criticized for his performance against North Carolina State. Quote, doesn't have very good feel for the game with inconsistencies in his play. A couple notes about his fundamentals. Uh, Bo Nix out of Oregon is listed next. Highs improved significantly since transferring from Auburn with a great season showing 45 touchdown passes compared to three interceptions. Described as smart like Alex Smith. It's not a super great comp, but, you know, again, camp and all that. Although Alex Smith's camp is, well, let's just say smart. With good discipline and decision making. Some of the negatives, questions about his ability to feel the game and react under pressure with a scout noting he panics when things break down. Limited in terms of throwing outside the numbers at Oregon. And then finally, J.J. McCarthy, which, you know, again, interesting that he was listed last here. I'm pretty sure they're put in order. They all seem to be in order. Highs, tough and a winner with a strong game management style likened to his coach, Jim Harbaugh. Good short to intermediate passer and smart in distributing the ball. Some of the negatives, he was described, quote, as a one read, simple read guy with concerns about his accuracy and dynamic ability. He's seen as more of a game manager than a dynamic quarterback. I don't get that. I just, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I didn't watch a ton, but the little bit I did, it's like, okay, you got two Mahomesy type guys, and it's McCarthy and uh, Caleb Williams. Again, camp, not comp. Not saying he's as good. It's just play style. So, whatever. And then some of the potential red flags, small hands, for whatever that's worth, if you're into that for quarterbacks. He measured uh, pretty poorly in that category. Actually, you know what? I lied. There's one more quarterback. Michael Penix out of Washington. Also made the top 55, not surprisingly. Some of the highs, best deep ball I've seen, said one um, scout, with strong production and confidence in his arm, noted improvement and reinvention after transferring with a, quote, hell of a team this year. Some of the lows, concerns about his durability due to his history of season-ending injuries. It's never a great sentence. Inconsistent mechanics and accuracy with some scouts questioning his toughness. Um, Obviously, the flags would be his injuries, extensive injury history, including ACL tears and shoulder surgeries, which could impact his longevity and performance at the next level. All right, uh, it's a little bit early, but why don't we take our first break? We'll come back and look at the rest of the offense. Um, We've got, what do we got here? Um, There's nine wide receivers. There's 32 total offensive pieces in the top 55. Obviously, that's more than half, so it's more of an offensive um, top of the draft, I guess. Nine wide receivers is a lot, but not as many as 13 offensive linemen. Obviously, there's you know multiple positions, so it's kind of unfair comp, but um, that's a lot between offensive line and wide receivers. So that's what we're going to check out next. Then we'll probably take a break and uh, get to some calls if there's no news and notesy mm-hmm. stuff. So We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Guys, I want to take a quick minute just to tell you about our new sponsor, Factor. If you, like me, had a New Year's resolution to lose a little bit of weight, and you've been struggling a little bit, Factor can help you with that. They have delicious, ready-to-eat meals that are never frozen. I'll be honest, when I got it, I was like, what are you talking about? It's not frozen. It came in a frozen package, and then I looked at it. Nope, it wasn't frozen. And you can taste it when you eat it. My family is obsessed with these factor meals, especially my oldest daughter. They got fancy meals that I can't even pronounce. And all you got to do is pop them in the microwave for two minutes and it's ready to go. They got pancakes, smoothies, and more. No prep, no mess. Pop it in the microwave and it's ready to rock and roll. They're also very flexible for your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals each week. Plus, you can pause and reschedule. Factor is the perfect option if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking required. 
So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom-heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. All right, so wide receivers in order. These are the ones that made the top 55. Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors. Rome Dunze, Brian Thomas, Xavier Worthy, Adani Mitchell, or Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Leggett, Keon Coleman, and Troy Franklin. And remember, top 55 is like, you're, you're freaking solid, right? <laughs> it's, it's the top half of the top 100. But we'll start off with Mr. Marvin Harrison. Quote, he's the real deal. With exceptional size, quickness, and ability to catch everything, compared to Calvin Johnson and Larry Fitzgerald for his body control and run after the catch. Some of the negatives didn't work out at the Combine, chose to skip the scheduled media interview, which could raise questions about transparency, but I think everybody kind of understands that. And number two, Malik Neighbors, exceptional after the catch with, quote, thick running back build and toughness, strong run after the catch likened to DJ Moore. Some of the negatives drop passes in key situations, possibly due to eagerness to run after the catch. Some concerns about elite ball skills. <laughs> it's a weird sentence. There are some questions as far as red flags about his maturity and his volatility that could uh, hinder reaching his potential. The exact quote was, he's got some volatility, some immaturity. Roma Dunze out of Washington. Impressive final season with career best in interceptions, yards, and touchdowns. Excellent combine performance with a 4.4540 and a 39-inch vert. Some of the concerns are about his quickness and ability to separate from defenders. Some scouts worry about his lack of explosiveness. Brian Thomas out of LSU. Tall, long, and can run with a notable 4.34 clocked at the combine. High potential with comps to Plaxico Burris. Perceived as an underachiever with concerns about his makeup. Quote, makeup-wise, it's a little bit of a concern. Xavier Worthy, extremely fast with a 4-2-1-40 time. Exceptional vert and broad jump scores compared to Jalen Waddell for his playmaking ability. Some of the negatives are about his weight and strength. Quote, only negative I had was his weight. Might require a special role in the NFL due to his build and potential questions about his hands. Adonai Mitchell out of Texas, good in traffic with a strong ability to use his body, impressive combine performance with a 4-3-4-40 and leading broad jump. He left Georgia due to limited time on the field, which might raise questions about his fit or development there. One of the scouts said he's more of a third round pick, indicating uh, there may be doubts about his readiness to contribute at a high level immediately. Xavier Leggett, compared to A.J. Brown for his physicality, strength, and competitive nature, impressive senior bowl and combine performances. Not a very good route runner with concerns about his football IQ. Quote, he's got some intelligence issues that might be a concern. Keon Coleman, athletic with great ball skills and potential for development, solid vert and broad jump performances. Had a disappointing 4-6-1-40 time at the combine, raising questions about his speed and separation ability. Quote, doesn't separate well said one of the scouts. Also some concerns about quickness and explosion. Finally, Troy Franklin out of Oregon. Worked out well at the combine. 4-4-1-40, 39-inch vert. Notable speed and playmaking ability. Questions about his strength and blocking attitude. Quote, big play ability, but disappears in some games. There are also two tight ends that made the top 55. Might be surprised to find out who they are. First of all is Brock Bowers, but second is my dude that I've been talking about for a while, kind of buried down the uh, the charts there, but Jared Wiley out of TCU. 
But starting off with Brock Bowers, um, better than the kid Atlanta took from Florida, talking about Kyle Pitts. Exceptional run after the catch ability, strong route runner, unexpectedly quick with, quote, exceptional athletic ability, strong hands, and speed. Some of the negatives, he's not as fast as Kyle Pitts and, quote, not an outgoing guy. A scout questioned his dynamic playmaking ability, noting, quote, he is not explosive, he's not fast. As far as Jared Wiley, uh, really a top receiver at 6'6", that was a quote, uh, impressive combine performance with a 4.6240 and 37-inch vert. Improved blocking from 2022 and 2023 likened to Travis Kelsey's play style. Some of the negatives noted primarily for receiving capabilities with room to grow in blocking. Quote, not a conventional why. Started only 12 of 32 games at Texas before transferring, suggesting potential inconsistencies in early college career. All right, kicking it over to offensive line next. We've got Joe Alt, Olufashanu, Troy Fontenu, J.C. Latham, Talisi Fuaga, Jordan Morgan, Amarius Mims, Graham Barton, Tyler Guyton, Patrick Paul, Chris Haynes, Kieran Amagaji, and Tanner Bordellini. Starting at the top with Joe Alt, compared to his Pro Bowl father for natural talent and smoothness, exceptional pass technique, good pad level, pro ready, just like Joe Thomas. One quote says, natural left tackle, just smooth like his dad was. Pass technique is just exceptional. He's pro ready. Some of the negatives, uh, one quote says, not a real powerful guy at this point. And then uh, one person pointed out he's only played three years as a potential concern, I guess. Uh, Olu Fashanu, some of the positive quotes on him, basically impossible to bull rush, good run blocker. He's likened to Tony Baselli for nastiness and athleticism. Quote, he's probably more of a right tackle. Reminded me of Tony Baselli. There are some injury concerns. One of the quotes said he has not played an entire season healthy. And then as far as flags go, he's got smaller hands. It says for a large man, his hand size, eight and a half inches, was unbelievably small. Troy Fontenu out of Washington. Exceptional feet and athleticism. Quote, his pass pro is unreal. He's got some... Uh, Let's just say nastiness in him. As far as the negatives or flags, it's the same thing. Injury concerns. Quote, he's been hurt a lot, but he's a real good player when he's been healthy. J.C. Latham, described as a mauler. Quote, down through the years, I don't normally like Alabama offensive linemen that much. He's too nasty for his own good. Some, uh, let's see, maturity and effort concerns. Quote, there's some slight mental concerns and a little bit of immaturity. Another quote says, that's the kind of guy he is. I've never seen a guy just stand and watch plays as much as this guy does. <laughs> Yikes. Talisi Fuaga out of Oregon State. Quote, he is powerful, pretty easy mover for such a giant. Some of the negatives he's seen as either just a right tackle or possibly even a guard. Quote, he's a solid right tackle only, not really light on his feet. One guy went so far as to say, for me, he's second round, but I know where he's going. First round. Jordan Morgan out of Arizona, quote, in pass pro, he can mirror guys. He's my number two tackle, noted for being light on his feet and technique sound. One of the, I guess, negatives is that he's seen as a finesse player, quote, he's the most finesse of all the top guys, and also not really seen as a run blocker, quote, not as strong or nasty as the other top guys. Marius Mims, quote, he's a freak talent, but I don't think he starts 10 games, I don't think he started 10 games in his entire career. Um, quote, he's a project project. Not, j he's not very aggressive. And then finally, because he looks like an athlete doesn't mean he's actually athletic. So not a lot of love for Amarius Mims. Graham Barton out of Duke, listed as intelligent and versatile. Quote, he's a can't miss kid, really athletic. His handicap is a lack of length. One guy even said he's got to be a center. Tyler Guyton, noted for his natural athleticism. Quote, but you're talking about a six foot seven, three hundred and thirty pound guy with a with thirty four inch arms and a natural athlete. Negative comments. Quote: His technique just isn't very good. Definitely a finesse style. It's a popular thing to say about offensive linemen, I guess. Other quotes: The film's not great, but you're talking about a natural athlete. For whatever that's worth, I guess. Patrick Paul, out of Houston. Quote: He looks good. He's an easy mover for such a big guy. Another quote said, you're going to get pissed because he's not powerful. And then finally, poor technique, hands are wide every snap. Christian Haynes out of Connecticut. 
Quote, he's going to play pretty early. If he's your starting guard, you're really happy with him. On the lows, it says, previously not recommended by college staff. Quote, if you do him off the body, you won't like him. I have no idea what that means. Body appearance and strength were concerns despite, oh, if you do it off his, in other words, maybe if you base it off of his body. Anyways, body appearance and strength were concerns despite, despite a standout senior bowl and combine performance. Amagaji out of Yale. He's too big and talented. <laughs> okay. Some of the negatives, limited college experience and significant injury. Quote, he's a good looking guy uh, for the Ivy League. It's like he shouldn't be there. Some questions about him dominating lower tier competition and overall readiness for the NFL. And finally, Tanner Bordellini out of Wisconsin. Quote, really good athlete. Very, very smooth. Some concerns about his short arms. And despite impressive agility, concerns about his strength and physicality at higher levels of play. And then finally, and maybe somewhat surprising, only two running backs. And of the two running backs, it is Trey Benson and Jonathan Brooks. Maybe that's not surprising. I don't know. But for Trey Benson out of Florida State, impressive combine speed and potential second round talent. Quote, he is fast and sudden, got really good feet and hits home runs. Some of the not-so-flattering notes, not as strong in the passing game. Quote, he's not that great in the passing game. <laughs> uh, he does have a history of reconstructive knee surgery, which raises questions about his durability. Obviously, knee injuries, any injuries are not great. Knee injuries, especially for running backs, not super wonderful. Jonathan Brooks drew comps to B. John Robinson, which I'll be honest, that's exactly where my mind went. I looked at him and I'm like, bro, this, this just looks like a Texas running back to me. Versatile skill set, quote, he's explosive. Lowe's injury concerns due to a torn ACL, quote, he's hurt, but he's good. So again, injury concerns with Jonathan Brooks, probably pretty massive injury concerns, but the guy is, I freaking like that guy a lot. All right, that's it. We got through all of McGinn's uh, scout quotes on the top 55 guys or whatever. So uh, take it or leave it, I suppose. Why don't we take our final break and then we'll, uh, we'll do some calls. What do you think? We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. So I was doing some mock drafts and kind of been just going through it all. And I have my guys I like with uh, Josh Jacobs being the type of runner he is. And we do have A.J. Dillon, right, who let's not say he's similar to Josh Jacobs, but he's kind of of a similar style, sure. right, where he's, a, you know, they're both Big a little bit dude. bigger. bigger. Yeah. Uh, like shifty or power backs, right? Even though Dylan's not very shifty, but right. I like uh, Trey Benson. He's the the difference maker in this draft that fits our our team. So just having that one cut slasher for the defense we like, right? We have the gap guy and Jacob. Our zone one cut slasher would be uh, Trey Benson. So I think that's. Hopefully somebody we can target and get in the draft. I'm a big Trey Benson fan. He just has that breakaway speed. Sure. And he just has that, like, like he just, you know, he wiggle, wiggle in the hole, hits it and goes, and I really like it. He's got he's just something special about that guy. Yeah. So that's something I really like. Also, people aren't going to like this, but if for some reason the Packers get, like, an extra, like, second round beating uh, down. Somebody can trade it for the quarterbacks, but if for some like another luxury pick in a second, I think get another receiver. That's how we built the 2011 team, right? Every year, every other year, we picked up receivers. I know we got a lot of good ones now. I Jermaine Burton sitting right there in the second. He might make it to the first, but he is what Christian Watson can be, but can Christian Watson stay healthy? I don't know. This guy, he's an elite deep receiver, take the top off, 
Because I don't want Christian Watson to be our deep threat. He doesn't have the ball tracking ability. I want him to be. I want him to catch the ball across the middle and take it to the house. I want him to get a the ball as a screen. Like we've seen this guy is fast. Give him an end around. I know we got a bunch of guys that can do that now with Reed. <laughs> right. So it's like just the more tools, the better. Like I know everybody loves Bo Melton. I know everybody loves. Like well, we're five, honestly we're five deep, right? But. I, I just think that Burton would be somebody that could really, like, just be a consistent deep threat and that we can not just commit Watson to that role. Because I, I think Watson should be all over the field, too. And it's just so crazy because we got so many weapons that it's just like, let's throw another one in there. If somehow we got those two weapons, that'd be cool. <laughs> um, I really want to... Got cut off there, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not you know, massively opposed to any of that. Obviously, I have the um, the the general concern in the back of my mind of like, okay, who does what? You know, because we're not going to put nine guys out there. Um, so I, I I just feel like there's there's diminishing returns at some point as you continue to do that. Now, again, draft the best player available, go ahead and do it. But in terms of my excitement and my belief in, you know, like if we're just strictly going down and saying what is most likely to add value to the team, wide receiver, I think is relatively low because we already have guys that are probably not going to lose their jobs. So if you draft somebody in the second round, there is an unusually high likelihood that they will not see much playing time. But again, if we draft a wide receiver, dope. But here's part two of Daniel's call. Hey, Daniel again. Um, the question I had for you, because it seems like it's not as big of a topic because we're a couple of years out from the Zach Tom pick, right? But who is going to be the the couple tackles that, you know, the PSF mock draft has these guys going in the second or third, right? But then once you, you know, once, once you do like one of the other mock drafts, these guys are going third, fourth, right? So PFS higher on some of these good pass blocking guys and who is that Zach Tom that we're going to get in the third or fourth that's uh, somebody that's supposed to go earlier right even Rasheed Walker at one point Rasheed Walker on the PFS uh, mock draft that year was going in the third fourth round too we got him in the seventh right so oh. like, who are the, the players that the Packers are going to take at offensive line because there is a lot of them this year and it just goes so deep that it's interesting. And I don't know if you've talked about it yet, but I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe three, four names that are candidates for the the Tom profile. So let me know. What, let me know what, uh, who's out there. I'm trying to see. I haven't done any offensive line research. I haven't watched anybody's kick step. So let's see. Let me know. Go back, go. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you one name. Um, so, strangely, SIS has not come out with their um, just general. You can go to SIS draft. You know, just type that in Google. It'll pop up. They still have last year's stuff, so I don't know. I mean, we're, we're getting within a month here of the draft, so I don't know uh, why they wouldn't have that up yet. But I can go into SIS myself and kind of poke around a little bit. Um, it's kind of hard because it's not filtered based on guys that are in the draft. It's, it's the entirety of, uh, college football. But when I go to points earned per snap, for example, it's really hard, first of all, to find anybody. I mean, you got, um, especially at tackle Riley Malman of Wisconsin, Xavier Gray, uh, Delmar Glaze, Javon Foster, Josh Connerly, you know, just whatever. Um, the first tackle in the 2024 draft that I could find that's ranked really highly, and he's 18th, is Roger Rosengarten. Uh, he is currently listed as offensive tackle that is sitting at about 115. And then if you look at cumulative points earned under strictly pass blocking, they don't have per, per play for whatever reason, but points earned for pass blocking, he is second behind Delmar Glaze. Now, we could just go Delmar Glaze because he actually is, I think he's listed as a tackle on SIS, 
They have him listed as an interior guy here out of Maryland, uh, sitting at 173. That would be another guy to keep an eye on if you're just looking for any old uh, position on the offensive line. So I guess I'll give you two names, Delmar Glaze and then Mr. Rosengarten. Hey, Ryan, it's Craig from Indiana. Hey. I've uh, been doing uh, a lot of mock drafts for the last few weeks. It's kind of fun to keep doing it because, you know, things obviously change, like free agency and stuff. So right. um, early on when I was doing them, it seemed like often I would end up kind of trading back because what was sitting at 25, there was no really big separation. And so, you know, sometimes some of the trade offers – would get you, you know, move back a few spots and then get another pick later and, or something you might be able to use uh, as, as trade value. Um, you know, unless someone kind of fell into 25 that you weren't expecting, like Mitchell or uh, Verse or someone else. Um, but, but since free, free agency happened, I guess it feels like, and, I, and obviously I would like to hear your opinion, it feels like I'd rather have better and fewer picks this year. In other words, let's move up and get, you know, some really crackerjack player. Um, and I'm not saying move up to top 10 or something, but it looks like if we can move up into the teens and, you know, whether it's cornerback and you get Arnold or Mitchell or it's one of the edges with Lat, uh, Latu, is that his name, yeah. or Verse, or one of the offensive tackles like Puaga or uh, Bonnu or Mims or Latham. Um, it, it feels like on our team we have pretty good depth. Like when I think a quarterback, if, if you got a Mitchell or an Arnold, um, you know, you, you feel pretty good. If I don't know if we need another quarterback with, with uh, uh, Nixon in there and Stokes and Valentine and Valentine, and you got some pretty good depth there. And the same with Edge, right? If we got a, just a, a kick butt Edge player, uh, obviously we have pretty good depth at Edge. Um, and you're kind of building the future for what might happen with uh, Preston. Uh, and then, obviously, the the, the, the the offensive line needs showing up. So, again, if you if you move up and get one of those really good tackles or guards, um, it just feels like a, a draft where just some really high-quality um, and maybe fewer picks, would, would this would be a good year to do that, uh, given what we did in free agency. And, and, again, I just think how much experience we gained last year and, in a lot of our key positions. So uh, I know it all depends on how the board falls, but just uh, wondered what uh, what you thought of that. Because if, you, if you're moving up into the teens, you probably need to be working that, I would think, almost uh, maybe ahead of time. But uh, let me know your thoughts. Take care. Bye. Yeah, I mean, speaking purely theoretically, I, I agree. I think the Packers are in a spot now where it's you're, you're primarily looking for premier players. I mean, you could – dispute that with maybe some other spots you know you could say linebacker we just need a dude or whatever but I mean yeah you look at for example 11 picks compared to let's just say you know five solid players or or even three if you can get three home run hits I'm not talking about trade all the way up to just get three I'm talking about let's say we trade up and through the process of having let's say seven picks three of them end up being just absolute slam dunks. I mean, you can probably put those three anywhere, and that's going to be fantastic. I mean, if we get a... And, and I don't I don't mean top 10 player. In a, I'm just talking about a really solid guy. You know, you, you give me a, a, a decent number two corner, a safety, and a guard or something. It's like this this team is going to be... And, and then, you know, we have other guys that are that are going to be there through the draft. I'm not saying everybody else is trash. But, um, yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think we're kind of getting to that point where not all the way there where you have this like great roster that just needs one or two pieces, but they're pretty close. And um, I think you, you're generally right in terms of we don't need to just shotgun the draft and get as many picks as possible. Anyways, guys, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, you guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Have a good one. Bye-bye.